the scientific illusions by nikola tesla this article was published in electrical experimenter february 1919 in this original and revolutionizing discussion nikola tesla gives us something really new to think about first does the moon rotate on its axis second is the franklin pointed lightning rod correct in theory and operation third do wireless signals fly through space by means of so-called hertzian waves in the ether or are they propagated through the earth at prodigious velocity by means of earth-bound oscillations world-famous conundrums these questions which have been answered in many ways by some of the greatest scientists dr tesla explains these three predominant scientific fallacies in a masterly way so that everyone can understand them the human brain with all its wonderful capabilities and power is far from being a faultless apparatus most of its parts may be in perfect working order but some are atrophied undeveloped or missing altogether great men of all classes and professions scientists inventors and hard-headed financiers have placed themselves on record with impossible theories inoperable devices and unreliable schemes it is doubtful that there could be found a single work of any one individual free of error there is no such thing as an infallible brain invariably some cells or fibers are wanting or unresponsive with the result of impairing judgment sense of proportion or some other faculty a man of genius eminently practical whose name is a household word has wasted the best years of his life in a visionary undertaking a celebrated physicist was incapable of tracing the directions of an electric current according to a childishly simple rule the writer who was known to recite entire volumes by heart has never been able to retain in memory and recapitulate in their proper order the words designating the colors of the rainbow and can only ascertain them after long and laborious thought strange as it may seem our organs of reception too are deficient and deceptive as a semblance of life is produced by a rapid succession of inanimate pictures so many of our perceptions are but trickery of the senses devoid of reality the greatest triumphs of man were those in which his mind had to free itself from the influence of delusive appearances such was the revelation of buddha that self is an illusion caused by the persistence and continuity of mental images the discovery of copernicus that contrary to all observation this planet rotates around the sun the recognition of descartes that the human being is an automaton governed by external influence and the idea that the earth is spherical which led columbus to the finding of this continent and though the minds of individuals supplement one another and science and experience are continually eliminating fallacies and misconceptions much of our present knowledge is still incomplete and unreliable we have sophisms in mathematics which cannot be disproved even in pure reasoning free of the shortcomings of symbolic processes we are often arrested by doubt which the strongest intelligences have been unable to dispel experimental science itself most positive of all is not unfailing in the following i shall consider three exceptionally interesting errors in the interpretation and application of physical phenomena which have for years dominated the minds of experts and men of science one the illusion of the axial rotation of the moon it is well known since the discovery of galileo that the moon in traveling through space always turns the same face towards the earth this is explained by saying that while passing once around the mother planet the lunar globe performs just one revolution on its axis the spinning motion of a heavenly body must necessarily undergo modifications in the course of time being either retarded by resistances internal or external or accelerated owing to shrinkage and other causes an unalterable rotational velocity through all phases of planetary evolution is manifestly impossible what wonder then 
that at this very instant of its long existence our satellite should revolve exactly so and not faster or slower but many astronomers have accepted as physical fact that such rotation takes place it does not but only appears so it is an illusion a most surprising one too i will endeavor to make this clear by reference to figure one in which e represents the earth and m the moon the movement through space is such that the arrow firmly attached to the latter always occupies the position indicated with reference to the earth if one imagines himself as looking down on the orbital plane and follows the motion he will become convinced that the moon does turn on its axis as it travels around but in this very act the observer will have deceived himself to make the delusion complete let him take a washer similarly marked and supporting it rotatably in the centre carry it around a stationary object constantly keeping the arrow pointing towards the latter though to his bodily vision the disc will revolve on its axis such movement does not exist he can dispel the illusion at once by holding the washer fixedly while going around he will now readily see that the supposed axial rotation is only apparent an impression being produced by successive changes of position in space but more convincing proofs can be given that the moon does not and cannot revolve on its axis with this object in view attention is called to figure two in which both the satellite m and the earth e are shown embedded in a solid mass m one indicated by stippling and supposed to rotate so as to impart to the moon its normal translatory velocity evidently if the lunar globe could rotate as commonly believed this would be equally true of any other portion of mass m one as the sphere m two shown in dotted lines and then the part common to both bodies would have to turn simultaneously in opposite directions this can be experimentally illustrated in the manner suggested by using instead of one two overlapping rotatable washers as may be conveniently represented by circles m and m two and carrying them around a centre as e so that the plane and dotted arrows are always pointing towards the same centre no further argument is needed to demonstrate that the two gyrations cannot coexist or even be pictured in the imagination and reconciled in a purely abstract sense the truth is the so-called axial rotation of the moon is a phenomenon deceptive alike to the eye and mind and devoid of physical meaning it has nothing in common with real mass revolution characterized by effects positive and unmistakable volumes have been written on the subject and many erroneous arguments advanced in support of the notion thus it is reasoned that if the planet did not turn on its axis it would expose the whole surface to terrestrial view as only one half is visible it must revolve the first statement is true but the logic of the second is defective for it admits of only one alternative the conclusion is not justified as the same appearance can also be produced in another way the moon does rotate not on its own but about an axis passing through the centre of the earth the true and only one the unfailing test of the spinning of a mass is however the existence of energy of motion the moon is not possessed of such vis viva if it were the case then a revolving body as m one would contain mechanical energy other than that of which we have experimental evidence irrespective of this so exact a coincidence between the axial and orbital periods is in itself immensely improbable for this is not the permanent condition towards which the system is tending any axial rotation of a mass left to itself retarded by forces external or internal must cease even admitting its perfect control by tides the coincidence would still be miraculous but when we remember that most of the satellites exhibit this peculiarity the probability becomes infinitesimal three theories have been advanced for the origin of the moon 
according to the oldest suggested by the great german philosopher kant and developed by laplace in his monumental treatise mechanique celeste the planets have been thrown off from larger central masses by centrifugal force nearly forty years ago professor george h darwin in a masterful essay on tidal friction furnished mathematical proofs deemed unrefutable that the moon had separated from the earth recently this established theory has been attacked by professor t j j see in a remarkable work on the evolution of the stellar systems in which he propounds the view that centrifugal force was altogether inadequate to bring about the separation and that all planets including the moon have come from the depths of space and have been captured still a third hypothesis of unknown origin exists which has been examined and commented upon by professor w h pickering in popular astronomy of nineteen o seven and according to which the moon was torn from the earth when the latter was partially solidified this accounting for the continents which might not have been formed otherwise undoubtedly planets and satellites have originated in both ways and in my opinion it is not difficult to ascertain the character of their birth the following conclusions can be safely drawn one a heavenly body thrown off from a larger one cannot rotate on its axis the mass rendered fluid by the combined action of heat and pressure upon the reduction of the latter immediately stiffens being at the same time deformed by gravitational pull the shape becomes permanent upon cooling and solidification and the smaller mass continues to move about the larger one as though it were rigidly connected to it except for pendular swings or librations due to varying orbital velocity such motion precludes the possibility of axial rotation in the strictly physical sense the moon has never spun around as is well demonstrated by the fact that the most precise instruments have failed to show any measurable flattening in form two if a planetary body in its orbital movement turns the same side towards the central mass this is a positive proof that it has been separated from the latter and is a true satellite three a planet revolving on its axis in its passage around another cannot have been thrown off from the same but must have been captured two the fallacy of franklin's pointed lightning rod the display of atmospheric electricity has since ages been one of the most marvellous spectacles afforded to the sight of man its grandeur and power filled him with fear and superstition for centuries he attributed lightning to agents godlike and supernatural and its purpose in the scheme of this universe remained unknown to him now we have learned that the waters of the ocean are raised by the sun and maintained in the atmosphere delicately suspended that they are wafted to distant regions of the globe where electric forces assert themselves in upsetting the sensitive balance and causing precipitation thus sustaining all organic life there is every reason to hope that man will soon be able to control this life-giving flow of water and thereby solve many pressing problems of his existence atmospheric electricity became of special scientific interest in franklin's time faraday had not yet announced his epochal discoveries in magnetic induction but static frictional machines were already generally used in physical laboratories franklin's powerful mind at once leaped to the conclusion that frictional and atmospheric electricity were identical to our present view this inference seems obvious but in his time the mere thought of it was little short of blasphemy he investigated the phenomena and argued that if they were of the same nature then the clouds would be drained of all their charge exactly as the ball of a static machine and in seventeen forty nine he indicated in a published memoir how this could be done by the use of pointed metal rods the earliest trials were made by delebrand in france but franklin himself was the first to obtain a spark by using a kite in june seventeen fifty two 
when these atmospheric discharges manifest themselves today in our wireless station we feel annoyed and wish that they would stop but to the man who discovered them they brought tears of joy the lightning conductor in its classical form was invented by benjamin franklin in 1755 and immediately upon its adoption proved a success to a degree as usual however its virtues were often exaggerated so for instance it was seriously claimed that in the city of piotr maritzburg capital of natal south africa no lightning strikes occurred after the pointed rods were installed although the storms were as frequent as before experience has shown that just the opposite is true a modern city like new york presenting innumerable sharp points and projections in good contact with the earth is struck much more often than equivalent area of land statistical records carefully compiled and published from time to time demonstrate that the danger from lightning to property and life has been reduced to a small percentage by franklin's invention but the damage by fire amounts nevertheless to several million dollars annually it is astonishing that this device which has been in universal use for more than one century and a half should be found to involve a gross fallacy in design and construction which impairs its usefulness and may even render its employment hazardous under certain conditions for explanation of this curious fact i may first refer to figure three in which s is a metallic sphere of radius r such as the capacity terminal of a static machine provided with a sharply pointed pin of length h as indicated it is well known that the latter has the property of quickly dissipating the accumulated charge into the air to examine this action in the light of present knowledge we may liken electric potential to temperature imagine that sphere s is heated to t degrees and that the pin or metal bar is a perfect conductor of heat so that its extreme end is at the same temperature t then if another sphere of larger radius v1 is drawn about the first and the temperature along this boundary is t1 it is evident that there will be between the end of the bar and its surrounding a difference of temperature t minus t1 which will determine the outflow of heat obviously if the adjacent medium was not affected by the hot sphere this temperature difference would be greater and more heat would be given off exactly so in the electric system let q be the quantity of the charge then the sphere and owing to its great conductivity also the pin will be at the potential q divided by r the medium around the point of the pin will be at the potential q divided by r1 equals q divided by the sum r plus h and consequently the difference q divided by r minus q divided by the sum r plus h equals q h divided by the quantity r times the sum of r plus h suppose now that a sphere s of much larger radius capital r equals lower case n r is employed containing a charge upper case q this difference of potential will be analogously capital q h divided by the product capital r times the sum capital r plus h according to elementary principles of electrostatics the potentials of the two spheres lower case s and upper case s will be equal if uppercase q equals lower case n q in which case capital q h divided by the product capital r times the sum capital r plus h equals the product lower case n q h divided by the product lower case n r times the sum n r plus h equals lower case q h divided by the product lower case r times the sum n r plus h thus the difference of potential between the point of the pin and the medium around the same will be smaller in the ratio r plus h divided by n r plus h when the large sphere is used in many scientific tests and experiments 
this important observation has been disregarded with the result of causing serious errors its significance is that the behavior of the pointed rod entirely depends on the linear dimensions of the electrified body its quality to give off the charge may be entirely lost if the latter is very large for this reason all points or projections on the surface of a conductor of such vast dimensions as the earth would be quite ineffective were it not for other influences these will be elucidated with reference to figure four in which our artist of the impressionist school has emphasized franklin's notion that his rod was drawing electricity from the clouds if the earth were not surrounded by an atmosphere which is generally oppositely charged it would behave despite all its irregularities of surface like a polished sphere but owing to the electrified masses of air and cloud the distribution is greatly modified thus in figure four the positive charge of the cloud induces in the earth an equivalent opposite charge the density at the surface of the latter diminishing with the cube of the distance from the static centre of the cloud a brush discharge is then formed at the point of the rod and the action franklin anticipated takes place in addition the surrounding air is ionized and rendered conducting and eventually a bolt may hit the building or some other object in the vicinity the virtue of the pointed end to dissipate the charge which was uppermost in franklin's mind is however infinitesimal careful measurements show that it would take many years before the electricity stored in a single cloud of moderate size would be drawn off or neutralized through such a lightning conductor the grounded rod has the quality of rendering harmless most of the strokes it receives though occasionally the charge is diverted with damaging results but what is very important to note it invites danger and hazard on account of the fallacy involved in its design the sharp point which was thought advantageous and indispensable to its operation is really a defect detracting considerably from the practical value of the device i have produced a much improved form of lightning protector characterized by the employment of a terminal of considerable area and large radius of curvature which makes impossible undue density of the charge and ionization of the air footnote refer to the october nineteen eighteen issue of this journal wherein dr tesla's new form of non-pointed lightning rod was fully described and illustrated and footnote these protectors act as quasi repellents and so far have never been struck though exposed a long time their safety is experimentally demonstrated to greatly exceed that invented by franklin by their use property worth millions of dollars which is now annually lost can be saved three the singular misconception of the wireless to the popular mind this sensational advance conveys the impression of a single invention but in reality it is an art the successful practice of which involves the employment of a great many discoveries and improvements i viewed it as such when i undertook to solve wireless problems and it is due to this fact that my insight into its underlying principles was clear from their very inception in the course of development of my induction motors it became desirable to operate them at high speeds and for this purpose i constructed alternators of relatively high frequencies the striking behavior of the currents soon captivated my attention and in eighteen eighty nine i started a systematic investigation of their properties and the possibilities of practical application the first gratifying result of my efforts in this direction was the transmission of electrical energy through one wire without return of which i gave demonstrations in my lectures and addresses before several scientific bodies here and abroad in eighteen ninety one and eighteen ninety two during that period while working with my oscillation transformers and dynamos of frequencies up to two hundred thousand cycles per second the idea gradually took hold of me that the earth might be used in place of the wire 
thus dispensing with artificial conductors altogether the immensity of the globe seemed an unsurmountable obstacle but after a prolonged study of the subject i became satisfied that the undertaking was rational and in my lectures before the franklin institute and national electric light association early in eighteen ninety three i gave the outline of the system i had conceived in the latter part of that year at the chicago world's fair i had the good fortune of meeting professor hemholtz to whom i explained my plan illustrating it with experiments on that occasion i asked the celebrated physicist for an expression of opinion on the feasibility of the scheme he stated unhesitatingly that it was practicable provided i could perfect apparatus capable of putting it into effect but this he anticipated would be extremely difficult to accomplish i resumed the work very much encouraged and from that date to eighteen ninety six advanced slowly but steadily making a number of improvements the chief of which was my system of concatenated tuned circuits and method of regulation now universally adopted in the summer of eighteen ninety seven lord kelvin happened to pass through new york and honored me by a visit to my laboratory where i entertained him with demonstrations in support of my wireless theory he was fairly carried away with what he saw but nevertheless condemned my project in emphatic terms qualifying it as something impossible an illusion and a snare i had expected his approval and was pained and surprised but the next day he returned and gave me a better opportunity for explanation of the advances i had made and of the true principles underlying the system i had evolved suddenly he remarked with evident astonishment then you are not making use of hertz waves certainly not i replied these are radiations no energy could be economically transmitted to a distance by any such agency in my system the process is one of true conduction which theoretically can be effected at the greatest distance without appreciable loss i can never forget the magic change that came over the illustrious philosopher the moment he freed himself from that erroneous impression the skeptic who would not believe was suddenly transformed into the warmest of supporters he parted from me not only thoroughly convinced of the scientific soundness of the idea but strongly expressed his confidence in its success in my exposition to him i resorted to the following mechanical analogues of my own and the hertz wave system imagine the earth to be a bag of rubber filled with water a small quantity of which is periodically forced in and out of the same by means of a reciprocating pump as illustrated if the strokes of the latter are effected in intervals of more than one hour and forty-eight minutes sufficient for the transmission of the impulse through the whole mass the entire bag will expand and contract and corresponding movements will be imparted to pressure gauges or movable pistons with the same intensity irrespective of distance by working the pump faster shorter waves will be produced which on reaching the opposite end of the bag may be reflected and give rise to stationary nodes and loops but in any case the fluid being incompressible its enclosure perfectly elastic and the frequency of oscillations not very high the energy will be economically transmitted and very little power consumed so long as no work is done in the receivers this is a crude but correct representation of my wireless system in which however i resort to various refinements thus for instance the pump is made part of a resonant system of great inertia enormously magnifying the force of the impressed pulses the receiving devices are similarly conditioned and in this manner the amount of energy collected in them vastly increased the hertz wave system is in many respects the very opposite of this to explain it by analogy the piston of the pump is assumed to vibrate to and fro at a terrific rate and the orifice through which the fluid passes in and out of the cylinder is reduced to a small hole 
there is scarcely any movement of the fluid and almost the whole work performed results in the production of radiant heat of which an infinitesimal part is recovered in a remote locality however incredible it is true that the minds of some of the ablest experts have been from the beginning and still are obsessed by this monstrous idea and so it comes that the true wireless art to which i laid the foundation in eighteen ninety three has been retarded in its development for twenty years this is the reason why the statics have proved unconquerable why the wireless shares are of little value and why the government has been compelled to interfere we are living on a planet of well-nigh inconceivable dimensions surrounded by a layer of insulating air above which is a rarefied and conducting atmosphere figure five this is providential for if all the air were conducting the transmission of electrical energy through the natural media would be impossible my early experiments have shown that currents of high frequency and great tension readily pass through an atmosphere but moderately rarefied so that the insulating stratum is reduced to a small thickness as will be evident by inspection of figure six in which a part of the earth and its gaseous envelope is shown to scale if the radius of the sphere is twelve and a half inches then the non-conducting layer is only one sixty-fourth of an inch thick and it will be obvious that the hertzian rays cannot traverse so thin a crack between two conducting surfaces for any considerable distance without being absorbed the theory has been seriously advanced that these radiations pass around the globe by successive reflections but to show the absurdity of this suggestion reference is made to figure seven in which this process is diagrammatically indicated assuming that there is no refraction the rays as shown on the right would travel along the sides of a polygon drawn around the solid and inscribed into the conducting gaseous boundary in which case the length of the side would be about four hundred miles as one half the circumference of the earth is approximately twelve thousand miles long there will be roughly thirty deviations the efficiency of such a reflector cannot be more than twenty five per cent so that if none of the energy of the transmitter were lost in other ways the part recovered would be measured by the fraction one fourth to the thirtieth power let the transmitter radiate hertz waves at the rate of one thousand kilowatts then one hundred and fifteen billionth part of one watt is all that would be collected in a perfect receiver in truth the reflections would be much more numerous as shown on the left of the figure and owing to this and other reasons on which it is unnecessary to dwell the amount recovered would be a vanishing quantity consider now the process taking place in the transmission by the instrumentalities and methods of my invention for this purpose attention is called to figure eight which gives an idea of the mode of propagation of the current waves and is largely self-explanatory the drawing represents a solar eclipse with the shadow of the moon just touching the surface of the earth at a point where the transmitter is located as the shadow moves downward it will spread over the earth's surface first with infinite and then gradually diminishing velocity until at a distance of about six thousand miles it will attain its true speed in space from there on it will proceed with increasing velocity reaching infinite value at the opposite point of the globe it hardly need be stated that this is merely an illustration and not an accurate representation in the astronomical sense the exact law will be readily understood by reference to figure nine in which a transmitting circuit is shown connected to earth and to an antenna the transmitter being in action two effects are produced hertz waves pass through the air and a current traverses the earth the former propagate with the speed of light and their energy is unrecoverable in the circuit the latter proceeds with the speed varying as the cosecant of the angle which a radius drawn from any point under consideration forms with the axis of symmetry of the waves at the origin the speed is infinite but gradually diminishes until a quadrant is traversed 
then the velocity is that of light. From there on, it again increases, becoming infinite at the antipole. Theoretically, the energy of this current is recoverable in its entirety, in properly attuned receivers. Some experts, whom I have credited with better knowledge, have for years contended that my proposals to transmit power without wires are sheer nonsense, but I note that they are growing more cautious every day. The latest objection to my system is found in the cheapness of gasoline. These men labor under the impression that the energy flows in all directions, and that, therefore, only a minute amount can be recovered in any individual receiver. But this is by far from being so. The power is conveyed in only one direction, from the transmitter to the receiver, and none of it is lost elsewhere. It is perfectly practicable to recover at any point of the globe energy enough for driving an airplane, or a pleasure boat, or for lighting a dwelling. I am especially sanguine in regard to the lighting of isolated places, and believe that a more economical and convenient method can hardly be devised. The future will show whether my foresight is as accurate now as it has proved heretofore. End of section 7「Tesla's Egg of Columbus」by Nikola Tesla. This article was published in Electrical Experimenter, March 1919. Tesla's Egg of Columbus – How Tesla Performed the Feat of Columbus Without Cracking the Egg Probably one of the most far-reaching and revolutionary discoveries made by Mr. Tesla is the so-called rotating magnetic field. This is a new and wonderful manifestation of force, a magnetic cyclone, producing striking phenomena which amazed the world when they were first shown by him. It results from the joint action of two or more alternating currents definitely related to one another, and creating magnetic fluxes, which, by their periodic rise and fall according to a mathematical law, cause a continuous shifting of the lines of force. There is a vast difference between an ordinary electromagnet and that invented by Tesla. In the former, the lines are stationary. In the latter, they are made to whirl around at a furious rate. The first attracts a piece of iron and holds it fast. The second causes it to spin in any direction and with any speed desired. Long ago, when Tesla was still a student, he conceived the idea of the rotating magnetic field, and this remarkable principle is embodied in his famous induction motor and system of transmission of power now in universal use. In this issue of The Electrical Experimenter, Mr. Tesla gives a remarkable account of his early efforts and trials as an inventor, and of his final success. Unlike other technical advances, arrived at through the usual hit-and-miss methods and haphazard experimentation, the rotating field was purely the work of scientific imagination. Tesla developed and perfected, entirely in his mind, this great idea in all its details and applications, without making one single experiment. Not even the usual first model was used. When the various forms of apparatus he had devised were tried for the first time, they worked exactly as he had imagined, and he took out some forty fundamental patents covering the whole vast region he had explored. He obtained the first rotations in the summer of 1883, after five years of constant and intense thought on the subject, and then undertook the equally difficult task of finding believers in his discovery. The alternating current was but imperfectly understood, and had no standing with engineers or electricians, and for a long time Tesla talked to deaf ears. But ultimately his pains were rewarded, and early in 1887 a company bearing his name was formed for the commercial introduction of the invention. Dr. Tesla recently told the editors an amusing incident in this connection. He had approached a Wall Street capitalist, a prominent lawyer with a view of getting financial support, and this gentleman called in a friend of his, a well-known engineer at the head of one of the big corporations in New York, to pass upon the merits of the scheme. This man was a practical expert, who knew of the failures in the industrial exploitation of alternating currents, 
and was distinctly prejudiced to a point of not caring even to witness some tests. After several discouraging conferences, Mr. Tesla had an inspiration. Everybody has heard of the Egg of Columbus. The saying goes that at a certain dinner, the great explorer asked some scoffers of his project to balance an egg on its end. They tried it in vain. He then took it, and cracking the shell slightly by a gentle blow, made it stand upright. This may be a myth, but the fact is that he was granted an audience by Isabella, the Queen of Spain, and won her support. There is a suspicion that she was more impressed by his portly bearing than the prospect of his discovery. Whatever it might have been, the Queen pawned her jewels, and three ships were equipped for him, and so it happened that the Germans got all that was coming to them in this war. But to return to Tesla's reminiscence. He said to these men, Do you know the story of the Egg of Columbus? Of course they did. Well, he continued, what if I could make an egg stand on the pointed end without cracking the shell? If you could do this, we would admit that you had gone Columbus one better. And would you be willing to go out of your way as much as Isabella? We have no crown jewels to pawn, said the lawyer, who was a wit. But there are a few ducats in our buckskins, and we might help you to an extent. Mr. Tesla thus succeeded in capturing the attention and personal interest of these very busy men, extremely conservative and reluctant to go into any new enterprise, and the rest was easy. He arranged for a demonstration the following day. A rotating field magnet was fastened under the top board of a wooden table, and Mr. Tesla provided a copper-plated egg and several brass balls and pivoted iron discs for convincing his prospective associates. He placed the egg on the table, and to their astonishment it stood on end. But when they found that it was rapidly spinning, their stupefaction was complete. The brass balls and pivoted iron discs in turn were set spinning rapidly by the rotating field, to the amazement of the spectators. No sooner had they regained their composure than Tesla was delighted with the question, do you want any money? Columbus was never in a worse predicament, said the great inventor, who had parted with his last portrait of George Washington in defraying the expenses of the preparation. Before the meeting adjourned, he had a substantial check in his pocket, and it was given with the assurance that there was more to be had in the same bank. That started the ball rolling. Tens of millions of horsepower of Tesla's induction motors are now in use all over the world, and their production is rising like a flood. In 1893, Mr. Albert Schmid, then superintendent of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company, constructed a powerful rotating field ring with an egg made of copper, and larger than that of an ostrich, for Dr. Tesla's personal collection at the Chicago World's Fair. This piece of apparatus was one of the most attractive novelties ever publicly shown, and drew enormous crowds every day. Subsequently, it was taken to Mr. Tesla's laboratory, and served there permanently for demonstrating rotating field phenomena. In his experiments, it was practicable to use as much as 200 horsepower for a short time, without overheating the wires, and the effects of the magnetic forces were wonderfully fascinating to observe. This is the very ring indicated in the accompanying photograph, figure 1, giving a view of Mr. Tesla's former laboratory at 46 East Houston Street, New York. It is shown in detail in figure 2, and the mode of winding is illustrated in diagram, figure 3. Originally, the two-phase arrangement was provided, but Mr. Tesla transformed it to the three- and four-phase when desired. On top of the ring was fastened a thin circular board, slightly hollowed, and provided around its circumference with a guard to prevent the objects from flying off. Even more interesting than the spinning egg was the exhibition of planetary motion. In this experiment, one large and several small brass balls were usually employed. When the field was energized, all the balls would be set spinning, the large one remaining in the center, while the small ones revolved around it, like moons about a planet, gradually receding until they reached the outer guard and raced along the same. But the demonstration which most impressed the audiences was the simultaneous operation of numerous balls, pivoted discs, and other devices placed in all sorts of positions and at considerable distances from the rotating field. When the currents were turned on, and the whole animated with motion, it presented an unforgettable spectacle. 
Mr. Tesla had many vacuum bulbs in which small, light metal discs were pivotally arranged on jewels, and these would spin anywhere in the hall when the iron ring was energized. Rotating fields of 15,000 horsepower are now being turned out by the leading manufacturers, and it is very likely that in the near future capacities of 50,000 horsepower will be employed in the steel and other industries and ship propulsion by Tesla's electric drive, which, according to Secretary of the Navy Daniels' statement, has proved a great success. But any student interested in these phenomena can repeat all the classical experiments of Tesla by an expensive apparatus. For this purpose, it is only necessary to make two slip ring connections on an ordinary small direct current motor or dynamo, and to wind an iron ring with four coils, as indicated in diagram figure 3. No particular rule need be given for the windings, but it may be stated that he will get the best results if he will use an iron ring of comparatively small section, and wind it with as many turns of stout wire as practicable. He can heavily copper plate an egg, but he should bear in mind that Tesla's egg is not as innocent as that of Columbus. The worst that can happen with the latter is that it might be, er, uh, overripe, but the Tesla egg may explode with disastrous effect, because the copper plating is apt to be brought to a high temperature through the induced currents. The sensible experimenter will therefore first suck out the contents of the egg, thus satisfying both his appetite and thirst for knowledge. Besides the rotating field apparatus, Mr. Tesla had other surprises for his audiences, which were even more wonderful. So, for instance, the coil on three legs, visible in the foreground, was used to operate wireless motors, lamps, and other devices, and the spiral coil in the background served to show extraordinary high potential phenomena as streamers of great length. End of section 8「Tesla on High Frequency Generators」by Nikola Tesla. This article was published in Electrical Experimenter, April 1919. Editor, Electrical Experimenter. It is to be regretted that a letter addressed to me by Mr. J. Harris Rogers, in your care, was published in the March number of the Electrical Experimenter. Although the concurrence of our views in some wireless features might have made this desirable to so wide awake and enterprising a periodical as yours. Mr. Rogers seems to be a very appreciative gentleman, and nothing would be farther from my thoughts than to detract anything from his merit. But in a separate contribution which I expect to prepare for your next issue, I shall express myself on this subject without prejudice and in the interest of truth. However, the article by your Mr. H. Winfield Secor on America's Greatest War Invention, the Rogers Underground Wireless, contains a reference to a novel and original high-frequency generator of Mr. Rogers' invention. May I not, to use the President's elegant expression, call attention to the fact that this device was described by me years ago, as will be evident from the following excerpt of a communication which appeared in the Electrical Review of March 15, 1899. In speaking of circuit controllers, I said, I may mention here, based on a different principle, which is incomparably more effective, more efficient, and also simpler on the whole. It comprises a fine stream of conducting fluid, which is made to issue, with any desired speed, from an orifice connected with one pole of a generator, through the primary of the induction coil, against the other terminal of the generator placed at a small distance. This device gives discharges of remarkable suddenness, and the frequency may be brought within reasonable limits, almost to anything desired. I have used this device for a long time in connection with ordinary coils, and in a form of my own coil, with results greatly superior, in every respect, to those obtainable with the form of your letter. Make a few statements referring to such make-and-break devices in general, and various forms based on this new principle. I may add that a great many forms of this apparatus were constructed and employed by me for a long time, proving very convenient and useful. Water does not give particularly good results, 
being incapable of causing very abrupt changes, but electrolytes have the property of diminishing enormously in resistance when they are heated, and the effects are much more intense. Salts of lithium are especially efficient. Nikola Tesla, New York, February 20th, 1919. End of section 9. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The True Wireless by Nikola Tesla. This article was published in Electrical Experimenter, May 1919. Ever since the announcement of Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, scientific investigators all the world over had been bent on its experimental verification. They were convinced that it would be done, and lived in an atmosphere of eager expectancy, unusually favorable to the reception of any evidence to this end. No wonder, then, that the publication of Dr. Heinrich Hertz's results caused a thrill as had scarcely ever been experienced before. At that time, I was in the midst of pressing work in connection with the commercial introduction of my system of power transmission, but nevertheless caught the fire of enthusiasm and fairly burned with desire to behold the miracle with my own eyes. Accordingly, as soon as I had freed myself of these imperative duties and resumed research work in my laboratory on Grand Street, New York, I began, parallel with high-frequency alternators, the construction of several forms of apparatus, with the object of exploring the field opened up by Dr. Hertz. Recognizing the limitations of the devices he had employed, I concentrated my attention on the production of a powerful induction coil, but made no notable progress until a happy inspiration led me to the invention of the oscillation transformer. In the latter part of 1891, I was already so far advanced in the development of this new principle that I had at my disposal means vastly superior to those of the German physicist. All my previous efforts with Rumkorff coils had left me unconvinced, and in order to settle my doubts, I went over the whole ground once more, very carefully, with these improved appliances. Similar phenomena were noted greatly magnified in intensity, but they were susceptible of a different and more plausible explanation. I considered this so important that in 1892 I went to Bonn, Germany, to confer with Dr. Hertz in regard to my observations. He seemed disappointed to such a degree that I regretted my trip and parted from him sorrowfully. During the succeeding years I made numerous experiments with the same object, but the results were uniformly negative. In 1900, however, after I had evolved a wireless transmitter, which enabled me to obtain electromagnetic activities of many millions of horsepower, I made a last desperate attempt to prove that the disturbances emanating from the oscillator were either vibrations akin to those of light, but met again with utter failure. For more than 18 years, I have been reading treatises, reports of scientific transactions, and articles on Hertz wave telegraphy to keep myself informed, but they always impressed me like works of fiction. The history of science shows that theories are perishable. With every new truth that is revealed, we get a better understanding of nature, and our conceptions and views are modified. Dr. Hertz did not discover a new principle. He merely gave material support to a hypothesis, which had been long ago formulated. It was a perfectly well-established fact that a circuit, traversed by a periodic current, emitted some kind of space waves, but we were in ignorance as to their character. He apparently gave an experimental proof that they were transversal vibrations in the ether, most people look upon this as his great accomplishment. To my mind, it seems that his immortal merit was not so much in this as in the focusing of the investigator's attention on the processes taking place in the ambient medium. The Hertz wave theory, by its fascinating hold on the imagination, 
has stifled creative effort in the wireless art and retarded it for twenty-five years but on the other hand it is impossible to overestimate the beneficial effects of the powerful stimulus it has given in many directions as regards signaling without wires the application of these radiations for the purpose was quite obvious when dr hertz was asked whether such a system would be of practical value he did not think so and he was correct in his forecast the best that might have been expected was a method of communication similar to the heliographic and subject to the same or even greater limitations in the spring of eighteen ninety one i gave my demonstrations with a high-frequency machine before the american institute of electrical engineers at columbia college which laid the foundation to a new and far more promising departure although the laws of electrical resonance were well known at that time and my lamented friend dr john hopkinson had even indicated their specific application to an alternator in the proceedings of the institute of electrical engineers london november thirteenth eighteen eighty nine nothing had been done toward the practical use of this knowledge and it is probable that those experiments of mine were the first published exhibition with resonant circuits more particularly of a high frequency while the spontaneous success of my lecture was due to spectacular features its chief import was in showing that all kinds of devices could be operated through a single wire without return this was the initial step in the evolution of my wireless system the idea presented itself to me that it might be possible under observance of proper conditions of resonance to transmit electric energy through the earth, thus dispensing with all artificial conductors. Anyone who might wish to examine impartially the merit of that early suggestion must not view it in the light of present-day science. I only need to say that as late as 1893, when I had prepared an elaborate chapter on my wireless system, dwelling on its various instrumentalities and future prospects, Mr. Joseph Wetzler and other friends of mine emphatically protested against its publication, on the ground that such idle and far-fetched speculations would injure me in the opinion of conservative businessmen. So it came that only a small part of what I intended to say was embodied in my address of that year before the Franklin Institute and National Electric Light Association, under the chapter on Electrical Resonance this little salvage from the wreck has earned me the title of father of the wireless from many well-disposed fellow workers rather than the invention of scores of appliances that have brought wireless transmission within the reach of every young amateur and which in a time not distant will lead to undertakings overshadowing in magnitude and importance all past achievements of the engineer the popular impression is that my wireless work was begun in 1893, but as a matter of fact, I spent the two preceding years in investigations, employing forms of apparatus, some of which were almost like those of today. It was clear to me from the very start that the successful consummation could only be brought about by a number of radical improvements suitable high-frequency generators and electrical oscillators had first to be produced the energy of these had to be transformed in effective transmitters and collected at a distance in proper receivers such a system would be manifestly circumscribed in its usefulness if all extraneous interference were not prevented and exclusiveness secured in time however i recognize that devices of this kind to be most effective and efficient should be designed with due regard to the physical properties of this planet and the electrical conditions obtaining on the same i will briefly touch upon the salient advances as they were made in the gradual development of the system the high frequency alternator employed in my first demonstrations is illustrated in figure one it comprised a field ring 
with 384 pole projections and a disc armature with coils wound in one single layer, which were connected in various ways, according to requirements. It was an excellent machine for experimental purposes, furnishing sinusoidal currents of from 10,000 to 20,000 cycles per second. The output was comparatively large, due to the fact that as much as 30 amperes per square millimeter could be passed through the coils without injury. The diagram in figure 2 shows the circuit arrangements as used in my lecture. Resonant conditions were maintained by means of a condenser subdivided into small sections, the finer adjustments being effected by a movable iron core within an inductance coil. Loosely linked with the latter was a high-tension secondary, which was tuned to the primary. The operation of devices through a single wire without return was puzzling at first because of its novelty, but can be readily explained by suitable analogues. For this purpose, reference is made to figures 3 and 4. In the former, the low-resistance electric conductors are represented by pipes of large section, the alternator by an oscillating piston, and the filament of an incandescent lamp by a minute channel connecting the pipes. It will be clear from a glance at the diagram the very slight excursions of the piston would cause the fluid to rush with high velocity through the small channel and that virtually all the energy movement would be transformed into heat by friction, similarly to that of the electric current in the lamp filament. The second diagram will now be self-explanatory. Corresponding to the terminal capacity of the electric system, an elastic reservoir is employed which dispenses with the necessity of a return pipe. As the piston oscillates, the bag expands and contracts, and the fluid is made to surge through the restricted passage with great speed, this resulting in the generation of heat as in the incandescent lamp. Theoretically considered, the efficiency of conversion of energy should be the same in both cases. Granted, then, that an economic system of power transmission through a single wire is practicable, the question arises how to collect the energy in the receivers. With this object, attention is called to figure 5, in which a conductor is shown excited by an oscillator joined to it at one end. Evidently, as the periodic impulses pass through the wire, differences of potential will be created along the same, as well as at right angles to it in the surrounding medium, and either of these may be usefully applied. Thus, at A, a circuit comprising an inductance and capacity is resonantly excited in the transverse, and at B, in the longitudinal sense, at C, energy is collected in a circuit parallel to the conductor, but not in contact with it, and again at D, in a circuit which is partly sunk into the conductor, and may be, or not, electrically connected to the same. It is important to keep these typical dispositions at mind, for however the distant actions of the oscillator might be modified through the immense extent of the globe, the principles involved are the same. Consider now the effect of such a conductor of vast dimensions on a circuit exciting it. The upper diagram of figure 6 illustrates a familiar oscillating system comprising a straight rod of self-inductance 2L with small terminal capacities, CC, and a node in the center. In the lower diagram of the figure, a large capacity, C, is attached to the rod at one end, with the result of shifting the node to the right through a distance corresponding to self-inductance, X. As both parts of the system on either side of the node vibrate at the same rate, we have evidently L plus X, C equals L minus X, C, from which X equals L, C minus C divided by C plus C. When the capacity C becomes commensurate to that of the Earth, X approximates L. In other words, the node is close to the ground connection. The exact determination of its position 
is very important in the calculation of certain terrestrial electrical and geodetic data, and I have devised special means with this purpose in view. My original plan of transmitting energy without wires is shown in the upper diagram of figure 7, while the lower one illustrates its mechanical analog, first published in my article in the Century Magazine of June 1900. An alternator, preferably of high tension, has one of its terminals connected to the ground and the other to an elevated capacity and impresses its oscillations upon the earth. At a distant point, a receiving circuit, likewise connected to ground and to an elevated capacity, collects some of the energy and actuates a suitable device. I suggested a multiplication of such units in order to intensify the effects, an idea which may yet prove valuable. In the analog, two tuning forks are provided, one at the sending and the other at the receiving station each having attached to its lower prong a piston fitting in a cylinder. The two cylinders communicate with a large elastic reservoir filled with an incompressible fluid. The vibrations transmitted to either of the tuning forks excite them by resonance and through electrical contacts or otherwise bring about the desired result. This, I may say, was not a mere mechanical illustration, but a simple representation of my apparatus for submarine signaling, perfected by me in 1892, but not appreciated at the time, although more efficient than the instruments now in use. The electric diagram in Figure 7, which was reproduced from my lecture, was meant only for the exposition of the principle. The arrangement, as I described it in detail, is shown in figure 8. In this case, an alternator energizes the primary of a transformer, the high-tension secondary of which is connected to the ground and an elevated capacity and tuned to the impressed oscillations. The receiving circuit consists of inductance connected to the ground and to an elevated terminal without break, and is resonantly responsive to the transmitted oscillations. A specific form of receiving device was not mentioned, but I had in mind to transform the received currents and thus make their volume and tension suitable for any purpose. This, in substance, is the system of today, and I am not aware of a single authenticated instance of successful transmission at considerable distance by different instrumentalities. It might perhaps not be clear to those who have perused my first description of these improvements that besides making known new and efficient types of apparatus, I gave to the world a wireless system of potentialities far beyond anything before conceived. I made explicit and repeated statements that I contemplated transmission absolutely unlimited as to terrestrial distance and amount of energy. But although I have overcome all obstacles, which seemed in the beginning unsurmountable, and found elegant solutions of all the problems which confronted me, yet even at this very day, the majority of experts are still blind to the possibilities which are within easy attainment. My confidence that a signal could be easily flashed around the globe was strengthened through the discovery of the rotating brush, a wonderful phenomenon which I have fully described in my address before the Institution of Electrical Engineers, London, in 1892, and which is illustrated in Figure 9. This is undoubtedly the most delicate wireless detector known, but for a long time it was hard to produce and to maintain in the sensitive state. These difficulties do not exist now, and I am looking to valuable applications of this device, particularly in connection with the high-speed photographic method, which I suggested in wireless as well as in wire transmission. Possibly the most important advances during the following three or four years were my system of concatenated tuned circuits and methods of regulation now universally adopted. The intimate bearing of these inventions on the development of the wireless art will appear from figure 10, 
which illustrates an arrangement described in my U.S. Patent Number 568178 of September 22, 1896, and corresponding dispositions of wireless apparatus. The captions of the individual diagrams are thought sufficiently explicit to dispense with further comment. I will merely remark that in this early record, in addition to indicating how any number of resonant circuits may be linked and regulated, I have shown the advantage of the proper timing of primary impulses and use of harmonics. In a farcical wireless suit in London, some engineers, reckless of their reputation, have claimed that my circuits were not at all attuned. In fact, they asserted that I had looked upon resonance as a sort of wild and untamable beast. It will be of interest to compare my system as first described to a Belgian patent of 1897 with the Hertz wave system of that period. The significant differences between them will be observed at a glance. The first enables us to transmit economically energy to any distance and is of inestimable value. The latter is capable of a radius of only a few miles and is worthless. In the first there are no spark gaps, and the actions are enormously magnified by resonance. In both transmitter and receiver, the currents are transformed and rendered more effective and suitable for the operation of any desired device. Properly constructed, my system is safe against static and other interference, and the amount of energy which may be transmitted is billions of times greater than with the Hertzian which has none of these virtues, has never been used successfully, and of which no trace can be found at the present. A well-advertised expert gave out a statement in 1899 that my apparatus did not work, and that it would take 200 years before a message would be flashed across the Atlantic, and he even accepted stolidly my congratulations on a supposed great feat but subsequent examination of the record showed that my devices were secretly used all the time and ever since i learned of this i have treated these borgia medici methods with the contempt in which they are held by all fair-minded men the wholesale appropriation of my inventions was however not always without a diverting side as an example to the point i may mention my oscillation transformer operating with an air gap this was in turn replaced by a carbon arc quenched gap an atmosphere of hydrogen argon or helium by a mechanical break with oppositely rotating members a mercury interrupter or some kind of vacuum bulb and by such tours de force as many new systems have been produced i refer to this of course without the slightest ill feeling let us advance by all means but I cannot help thinking how much better it would have been if the ingenious men who have originated these systems had invented something of their own instead of depending on me altogether. Before 1900, two most valuable improvements were made. One of these was my individualized system with transmitters emitting a wave complex and receivers comprising separate tuned elements cooperatively associated. The underlying principle can be explained in a few words. Suppose that there are n simple vibrations suitable for use in wireless transmission. The probability that any one tune will be struck by an extraneous disturbance is 1 divided by n. There will then remain n minus 1 vibrations, and the chance that one of these will be excited is 1 divided by n minus 1. Hence, the probability that two times would be struck at the same time is 1 divided by n times n minus 1. Similarly, for a combination of 3, the chance will be 1 divided by n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and so on. It will readily be seen that in this manner, any degree of safety against the statics or any kind of disturbance which can be attained provided the receiving apparatus is so designed that its operation is possible only through the joint action of all the tuned element. This was a difficult problem which I have successfully solved so that now any desired number of simultaneous messages 
is practicable in the transmission through the earth as well as through artificial conductors the other invention of still greater importance is a peculiar oscillator enabling the transmission of energy without wires in any quantity that may ever be required for industrial use to any distance and with very high economy it was the outcome of years of systematic study and investigation and wonders will be achieved by its means the prevailing misconceptions of the mechanism involved in the wireless transmission has been responsible for various unwarranted announcements which have misled the public and worked harm by keeping steadily in mind that the transmission through the earth is in every respect identical to that through a straight wire one will gain a clear understanding of the phenomena and will be able to judge correctly the merits of a new scheme without wishing to detract from the value of any plan that has been put forward i may say that they are devoid of novelty so for instance in figure twelve arrangements of transmitting and receiving circuits are illustrated which i have described in my u s patent number six one three eight o nine of november eighth eighteen ninety eight on a method of and apparatus for controlling mechanism of moving vessels or vehicles and which have been recently dished up as original discoveries in other patents and technical publications i have suggested conductors in the ground as one of the obvious modifications indicated in figure five for the same reason the statics are still the bane of the wireless there is about as much virtue in the remedies recently proposed as in hair restorers a small and compact apparatus has been produced which does away entirely with this trouble at least in plants suitably remodeled nothing is more important in the present phase of development of the wireless art than to dispose of the dominant erroneous ideas with this object i shall advance a few arguments based on my own observations which prove that hertz waves have little to do with the results obtained even at small distances in figure thirteen a transmitter is shown radiating space waves of considerable frequency it is generally believed that these waves pass along the earth's surface and thus affect the receivers I can hardly think of anything more improbable than this gliding wave theory and the conception of the guided wireless which are contrary to all laws of action and reaction why should these disturbances cling to a conductor where they are counteracted by induced currents when they can propagate in all other directions unimpeded the fact is that the radiations of the transmitter passing along the earth's surface are soon extinguished the height of the inactive zone indicated in the diagram being some function of the wavelength the bulk of the waves traversing freely the atmosphere the fact is that the radiations of the transmitter passing along the earth's surface are soon extinguished the height of the inactive zone indicated in the diagram being some function of the wavelength the bulk of the waves traversing freely the atmosphere terrestrial phenomena which i have noted conclusively show that there is no heaviside layer or if it exists it is of no effect it certainly would be unfortunate if the human race were thus imprisoned and forever without power to reach out into the depths of space the actions at a distance cannot be proportionate to the height of the antenna and the current in the same i shall endeavor to make this clear by reference to diagram in figure fourteen the elevated terminal charged to a high potential induces an equal and opposite charge in the earth and there are thus q lines giving an average current i equals four times q n which circulates locally and is useless except that it adds to the momentum a relatively small number of lines q however go off to great distance and to these corresponds a mean current of i e equals four q n which is due to the action at a distance the total average current in the antenna is thus i times m 
equals four times q n plus four times q n and its intensity is no criterion for the performance the electric efficiency of the antenna is q divided by q plus q and this is often a very small fraction dr l w austin and mr j l hogan have made quantitative measurements which are valuable but far from supporting the hertz wave theory they are evidences in disproval of the same as will be easily perceived by taking the above facts into consideration dr austin's researches are especially useful and instructive and i regret that i cannot agree with him on this subject i do not think that if his receiver was affected by hertz waves he could ever establish such relations as he has found but he would be likely to reach these results if the hertz waves were in a large part eliminated at great distance the space waves and the current waves are of equal energy the former being merely an accompanying manifestation of the latter in accordance with the fundamental teachings of maxwell at great distance the space waves and the current waves are of equal energy the former being merely an accompanying manifestation of the latter in accordance with the fundamental teachings of maxwell it occurs to me here to ask the question why have the hertz waves been reduced from the original frequencies to those i have advocated for my system when in so doing the activity of the transmitting apparatus has been reduced a billion fold i can invite any expert to perform an experiment such as illustrated in figure fifteen which shows the classical hertz oscillator and my grounded transmitting circuit it is a fact which i have demonstrated that although we may have in the hertz oscillator an activity thousands of times greater the effect on the receiver is not to be compared to that of the grounded circuit this shows that in the transmission from an airplane we are merely working through a condenser the capacity of which is a function of a logarithmic ratio between the length of the conductor and the distance from the ground the receiver is affected in exactly the same manner as from an ordinary transmitter the only difference being that there is a certain modification of the action which can be predetermined from the electrical constants it is not at all difficult to maintain communication between an airplane and a station on the ground on the contrary the feat is very easy to mention another experiment in support of my view i may refer to figure sixteen in which two grounded circuits are shown excited by oscillations of the hertzian order it will be found that the antennas can be put out of parallelism without noticeable change in the action of the receiver this proving that it is due to currents propagated through the ground and not to space waves particularly significant are the results obtained in cases illustrated in figures seventeen and eighteen in the former an obstacle is shown in the path of the waves but unless the receiver is within the effective electrostatic influence of the mountain range the signals are not appreciably weakened by the presence of the latter because the currents pass under it and excite the circuit in the same way as if it were attached to an energized wire if as in figure eighteen a second range happens to be beyond the receiver it could only strengthen the hertz wave effect by reflection but as a matter of fact it detracts greatly from the intensity of the received impulses because the electric niveau between the mountains is raised as i have explained in connection with my lightning protector in the experimenter of february again in figure nineteen two transmitting circuits one grounded directly and the other through an air gap are shown it is a common observation that the former is far more effective which could not be the case in a transmission with hertz radiations in like manner if two grounded circuits are observed from day to day the effect is found to increase greatly with the dampness of the ground and the same reason also the transmission through sea water is more efficient an illuminating experiment is indicated in figure twenty in which two grounded transmitters are shown 
one with a large and the other with a small terminal capacity. Suppose that the latter be one-tenth of the former, but that it is charged to ten times the potential, and let the frequency of the two circuits, and therefore the currents in both antennas, be exactly the same. The circuit with the smaller capacity will then have ten times the energy of the other, but the effects on the receiver will be in no wise proportionate. The same conclusions will be reached by transmitting and receiving circuits with wires buried underground. In each case, the actions carefully investigated will be found due to earth currents. Numerous other proofs might be cited which can be easily verified. So, for example, oscillations of low frequency are ever so much more effective in the transmission which is inconsistent with the prevailing idea. My observations in 1900 and the recent transmissions of signals to very great distances are another emphatic disproval. The Hertz wave theory of wireless transmission may be kept up for a while, but I do not hesitate to say that in a short time it will be recognized as one of the most remarkable and inexplicable aberrations of the scientific mind which has ever been recorded in history. End of section 10. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. Bulbs. June 1919. By Nikola Tesla. This article was published in Electrical Experimenter, June 1919. In the May issue, in his article, True Wireless, Nikola Tesla mentions the forerunner of the audion, a vacuum bulb which he used in his earlier experiments. We have been in receipt of numerous letters from many individuals interested in this bulb who desire further particulars as to its operation, etc. Accordingly, we publish herewith some excerpts from a lecture by Dr. Tesla delivered before the Institution of Electrical Engineers and Royal Institution, London, February 1892. I think it best at this juncture to bring before you a phenomenon observed by me some time ago, which to the purely scientific investigator may perhaps appear more interesting than any of the results which I have the privilege to present to you this evening. It may be quite properly ranked among the brush phenomena. In fact, it is a brush formed at or near a single terminal in high vacuum. In bulbs provided with a conducting terminal, though it be of aluminum, the brush has but an ephemeral existence, and cannot, unfortunately, be indefinitely preserved in its most sensitive state, even in a bulb devoid of any conducting electrode. In studying the phenomenon, by all means, a bulb having no leading-in wire should be used. I have found it best to use bulbs constructed as indicated in figures 1 and 2. In figure 1, the bulb comprises an incandescent lamp globe L, in the neck of which is sealed a barometer tube, B, the end of which is blown out to form a small sphere, S. This sphere should be sealed as closely as possible in the center of the large globe. Before sealing, a thin tube, T, of aluminum sheet may be slipped into the barometer tube, but it is not important to employ it. The small hollow sphere, S, is filled with some conducting powder, and a wire, W, is cemented in the neck for the purpose of connecting the conducting powder with the generator. The construction shown in figure two was chosen in order to remove from the brush any conducting body which might possibly affect it. The bulb consists in this case of a lamp globe L, which has a neck N provided with a tube B and a small sphere S sealed to it, so that two entirely independent compartments are formed as indicated in the drawing. When the bulb is in use, the neck N is provided with a tinfoil coating, which is connected to the generator and acts inductively upon the moderately rarefied and highly conducting gas enclosed in the neck. From there, the current passes through the tube B into the small sphere S to act by induction upon the gas contained in the globe L. It is of advantage to make the tube T very thick, the hole through it very small, and to blow the sphere S very thin. 
it is of the greatest importance that the sphere S be placed in the center of the globe L. Figures 3, 4, and 5 indicate different forms or stages of the brush. Figure 1 shows the brush as it first appears in a bulb provided with a conducting terminal, but as in such a bulb it very soon disappears, often after a few minutes, I will confine myself to the description of the phenomenon as seen in a bulb without conducting electrode. It is observed under the following conditions. When the globe L, figures 1 and 2, is exhausted to a very high degree, generally the bulb is not excited upon connecting the wire W, figure 1, or the tinfoil coating of the bulb, figure 2, to the terminal of the induction coil. Too excited, it is usually sufficient to grasp the globe L with the hand. An intense phosphorescence then spreads at first over the globe, but soon gives place to a white, misty light. Shortly afterward, one may notice that the luminosity is unevenly distributed in the globe, and after passing the current for some time, the bulb appears as in figure 4. From this stage, the phenomenon will gradually pass to that indicated in figure 5, after some minutes, hours, days, or weeks, according as the bulb is worked. Warming the bulb, or increasing the potential, hastens the transit. When the brush assumes the form indicated in figure 5, it may be brought to a state of extreme sensitiveness to electrostatic and magnetic influence. The bulb hanging straight down from a wire, and all objects being remote from it, the approach of the observer at a few paces from the bulb will cause the brush to fly to the opposite side, and if he walks around the bulb, it will always keep on the opposite side. It may begin to spin around the terminal long before it reaches the sensitive stage, when it begins to turn around principally, but also before it is affected by a magnet, and at a certain stage it is susceptible to magnetic influence to an astonishing degree. A small permanent magnet, with its poles at a distance of no more than two centimeters, will affect it visibly at a distance of two meters, slowing down or accelerating the rotation according to how it is held relatively to the brush. I think I have observed that at the stage when it is most sensitive to magnetic, it is not most sensitive to electrostatic influence. When the bulb hangs with the globe L down, the rotation is always clockwise. In the southern hemisphere, it would occur in the opposite direction, and on the equator, the brush should not turn at all. The rotation may be reversed by a magnet kept at some distance. The brush rotates best, seemingly, when it is at right angles to the lines of force of the Earth. It very likely rotates, when at its maximum speed, in synchronism with the alternations, say, 10,000 times a second. The rotation can be slowed down or accelerated by the approach or receding of the observer, or any conducting body, but it cannot be reversed by putting the bulb in any position. When it is in the state of the highest sensitiveness, and the potential or frequency be varied, the sensitiveness is rapidly diminished. Changing either of these but little will generally stop the rotation. The sensitiveness is likewise affected by the variations of temperature. To attain great sensitiveness, it is necessary to have the small sphere S in the center of the globe L, as otherwise the electrostatic action of the glass of the globe will tend to stop the rotation. The sphere S should be small and of uniform thickness. Any dissymmetry, of course, has the effect to diminish the sensitiveness. The fact that the brush rotates in a definite direction in a permanent magnetic field seems to show that in alternating currents of very high frequency, the positive and negative impulses are not equal, but that one always preponderates over the other. Of course, this rotation in one direction may be due to the action of the two elements of the same current upon each other, or to the action of the field produced by one of the elements upon the other, as in a series motor, without necessarily one impulse being stronger than the other. The fact that the brush turns, as far as I could observe, in any position, would account for this theory. In such case, it would turn at any point of the Earth's surface. But, on the other hand, it is then hard to explain why a permanent magnet should reverse the rotation, and one must assume the preponderance of impulses of one kind. As to the causes of the formation of the brush or stream, 
I think it is due to the electrostatic action of the globe and the dissymmetry of the parts. If the small bulb S and the globe L were perfect concentric spheres, and the glass throughout of the same thickness and quality, I think the brush would not form, as the tendency to pass would be equal on all sides. That the formation of the stream is due to an irregularity is apparent from the fact that it has the tendency to remain in one position, and rotation occurs most generally only when it is brought out of this position by electrostatic or magnetic influence. When in an extremely sensitive state, it rests in one position, and most curious experiments may be performed with it. For instance, the experimenter may, by selecting a proper position, approach the hand at a certain considerable distance to the bulb, and he may cause the brush to pass off by merely stiffening the muscles of the arm. When it begins to rotate slowly, and the hands are held at a proper distance, it is impossible to make even the slightest motion without producing a visible effect upon the brush. A metal plate connected to the other terminal of the coil affects it at a great distance, slowing down the rotation often to one turn a second. I am firmly convinced that such a brush, when we learn how to produce it properly, will provide a valuable aid in the investigation of the nature of the forces acting in an electrostatic or magnetic field. If there is any motion which is measurable going on in the space, such a brush ought to reveal it. It is, so to speak, a beam of light, frictionless, devoid of inertia. I think that it may find practical applications in telegraphy. With such a brush, it should be possible to send dispatches across the Atlantic, for instance, with any speed, since its sensitiveness may be so great that the slightest changes will affect it. If it were possible to make the stream more intense and very narrow, its deflections could be easily photographed. I have been interested to find whether there is a rotation of the stream itself or whether there is simply a stress traveling around the bulb. For this purpose, I mounted a light mica fan so that its veins were in the path of the brush. If the stream itself was rotating, the fan would be spun around. I could produce no distinct rotation of the fan, although I tried the experiment repeatedly. But as the fan exerted a noticeable influence on the stream, and the apparent rotation of the latter was, in this case, never quite satisfactory, the experiment did not appear to be conclusive. I have been unable to produce the phenomenon with the disruptive discharge coil, although every other form of these phenomena can be well produced by it. Many, in fact, much better than with coils operated from an alternator. It may be possible to produce the brush by impulses of one direction, or even by a steady potential, in which case it would be still more sensitive to magnetic influence. Figure 6 shows a practical application of the Tesla bulb. The bulb itself, as will be seen, is excited by means of a Tesla high-frequency alternator, which, in turn, is connected to the primary of a transformer. The secondary of the transformer is grounded at one end, while the other end of the transformer connects with the Tesla bulb. Dr. Tesla, in an interview, stated that the best way to use the bulb for such experiments is when the shaft of light is in the position as shown in figures 5 and 6, at rest, but in a state of equilibrium inconceivably delicate. This is fully described above in Dr. Tesla's lecture. The inventor states that in such a condition, the shaft of light is marvelously sensitive to magnetic disturbances. Dr. Tesla informs us that a toy permanent horseshoe magnet not longer than one-half inch and with its poles one-eighth inch apart could with ease throw the shaft of light out of its normal direction across the whole room. In our illustration, an electromagnet is shown a few inches away from light ray, and we can imagine a slot in a screen in such a way that normally no light falls through it. If, however, very faint radio telegraphic impulses surge through the electromagnet, the light ray will immediately become displaced and will fall into the slot. Inasmuch as this shaft of light has no inertia, it will follow exactly the dot and dash impulses surging through the electromagnet, no matter how rapidly they take place. They can then either be read off by the eye or, if desired, can be registered upon a fast-moving film. This method will, of course, only be used where the transmission is made at high speed, 
and where it would be impossible for an operator at the receiving end to follow the dots and dashes with the eye. The method shown by us in Figure 6, of course, represents only one. Many others can undoubtedly be evolved to use the Tesla bulb to advantage. End of Section 11「The Moon's Rotation」by Nikola Tesla Part 1 This article was published in Electrical Experimenter, April 1919. Since the appearance of my article entitled The Famous Scientific Illusions in your February issue, I have received a number of letters criticizing the views I expressed regarding the Moon's axial rotation. These have been partly answered by any statement to the New York Tribune of February 23rd, which allow me to quote, In your issue of February 2nd, Mr. Charles E. Manier, commenting upon my article in the Electrical Experimenter for February, which appeared in the Tribune of January 26, suggests that I give a definition of axial rotation. I intend to be explicit on this point, as may be judged from the following quotation. The unfailing test of the spinning of a mass is, however, the existence of energy of motion. The moon is not possessed of such vi viva. By this I meant that axial rotation is not simply rotation upon an axis nonchalantly defined in dictionaries, but is a circular motion in the true physical sense. That is, one in which half the product of the mass with the square of velocity is a definite and positive quantity. The moon is a nearly spherical body of a radius of about 1,087.5 miles, from which I calculate its volume to be approximately 5,300,216,300 cubic miles. Since its mean density is 3.27, one cubic foot of material composing it weighs close on 205 pounds. Accordingly, the total weight of the satellite is about 79,969 trillion, and its mass 2,483,500 terrestrial short tons. Assuming that the moon does physically rotate upon its axis, it performs one revolution in 27 days, 7 hours, 43 minutes, and 11 seconds, or 2,360,591 seconds. If, in conformity with mathematical principles, we imagine the entire mass concentrated at a distance from the center equal to two-fifths of the radius, then the calculated rotational velocity is 3.04 feet per second, at which the globe would contain 11,474 billion short foot tons of energy sufficient to run 1 billion horsepower for a period of 1,323 years. Now I say that there is not enough of that energy in the moon to run a delicate watch. In astronomical treatises, usually the argument is advanced that if the lunar globe did not turn upon its axis, it would expose all parts to terrestrial view. As only a little over one half is visible, it must rotate. But this inference is erroneous, for it only admits one alternative. There are an infinite number of axes besides its own, in each of which the moon might turn and still exhibit the same peculiarity. I have stated in my article that the moon rotates about an axis passing through the center of the earth, which is not strictly true, but it does not vitiate the conclusions I have drawn. It is well known, of course, that the two bodies revolve around a common center of gravity, which is at a distance of a little over 2,899 miles from the Earth's center. Another mistake in books on astronomy is made in considering this motion equivalent to that of a weight whirled on a string or in a sling. In the first place, there is an essential difference between these two devices, though involving the same mechanical principle. If a metal ball attached to a string is whirled around and the latter breaks, an axial rotation of the missile results which is definitely related in magnitude and direction to the motion preceding. 
by way of illustration if the ball is whirled on the string clockwise ten times per second then when it flies off it will rotate on its axis ten times per second likewise in the direction of a clock quite different are the conditions when the ball is thrown from a sling in this case a much more rapid rotation is imparted to it in the opposite sense there is no true analogy to these in the motion of the moon if the gravitational string as it were would snap the satellite would go off in a tangent without the slightest swerving or rotation for there is no moment about the axis and consequently no tendency whatever to spinning motion mr manier is mistaken in his surmise as to what would happen if the earth were suddenly eliminated let us suppose that this would occur at the instance when the moon is in opposition then it would continue on its elliptical path around the sun presenting to it steadily the face which was always exposed to the earth if on the other hand the latter would disappear at the moment of conjunction the moon would gradually swing around through one hundred and eighty degrees and after a number of oscillations revolve again with the same face to the sun in either case there would be no periodic changes but eternal day and night respectively on the sides turned towards and away from the luminary some of the arguments advanced by the correspondents are ingenious and not a few comical none however are valid one of the writers imagines the earth in the centre of a circular orbital plate having fixedly attached to its peripheral portion a disc-shaped moon in frictional or geared engagement with another disc of the same diameter and freely rotatable on a pivot projecting from an arm entirely independent of the planetary system the arm being held continuously parallel to itself the pivoted disc of course is made to turn on its axis as the orbital plate is rotated this is a well-known drive and the rotation of the pivoted disc is as palpable a fact as that of the orbital plate but the moon in this model only revolves about the center of the system without the slightest angular displacement on its own axis the same is true of a cartwheel to which this writer refers so long as it advances on the earth's surface it turns on the axle in the true physical sense when one of its spokes is always kept in a perpendicular position the wheel revolves around the earth's center but axial rotation has ceased those who think that it then still exists are laboring under an illusion an obvious fallacy is involved in the following abstract reasoning the orbital plate is assumed to gradually shrink so that finally the centers of the earth and the satellite coincide when the latter revolves simultaneously about its own and the earth's axis we may reduce the earth to a mathematical point and the distance between the two planets to the radius of the moon without affecting the system in principle but a further diminution of the distance is manifestly absurd and of no bearing on the question under consideration in all the communications i have received though different in the manner of presentation the successive changes of position in space are mistaken for axial rotation so for instance a positive refutation of my arguments is found in the observation that the moon exposes all sides to other planets it revolves to be sure but none of the evidences is a proof that it turns on its axis even the well-known experiment with the Foucault pendulum, although exhibiting similar phenomena as on our globe, would merely demonstrate a motion of the satellite about some axis. The view I have advanced is not based on a theory, but on facts, demonstrable by experiment. It is not a matter of definition as some would have it. A mass revolving on its axis must be possessed of momentum. If it has none, there is no axial rotation, all appearances to the contrary notwithstanding. A few simple calculations based on well-established mechanical principles will make this clear. 
Consider the first case of two equal weights, W and WS, in figure 1, whirled about the center 0 on a string S, as shown. Assuming the latter to break at A, both weights will fly off on tangents to their circles of gyration, and being animated with different velocities, they will rotate around their common center of gravity, 0. If the weights are whirled n times per second, then the speed of the outer and the inner one will be, respectively, v equals 2 times r plus small r, n and v equals 2 pi times r minus r, n, and the difference v minus v squared equals 4 pi times r times n will be the length of the circular path of the outer weight. Inasmuch, however, there will be equalization of the speeds until the mean value is attained. We shall have v minus v1 divided by 2 equals 2 pi r n equals 2 pi r large n, large n being the number of revolutions per second of the weights around their center of gravity. Evidently, then, the weights continue to rotate at the original weight and in the same direction. I know this to be a fact from actual experiments. It also follows that a ball, as that shown in the figure, will behave in a similar manner for the two half-spherical masses can be concentrated at their centers of gravity, and m and m1, respectively, will be at a distance from 0 equal to 3 eighths times r. This being understood, imagine a number of balls, m, carried by as many spokes, s, radiating from a hub, h, as illustrated in figure 2, and let this system be rotated n times per second, around center 0 on frictionless bearings. A certain amount of work will be required to bring the structure to this speed, and it will be found that it equals exactly half the product of the masses, with the square of the tangential velocity. Now, if it be true that the moon rotates in reality on its axis, this must also hold good for each of the balls as it performs the same kind of movement. Therefore, imparting to the system a given velocity, energy must have been used up in the axial rotation of the balls. Let m be the mass of one of these and r the radius of gyration then the rotational energy will be e equals one half m times two pi r n squared since for one complete turn of the wheel every ball makes one revolution on its axis according to the prevailing theory the energy of axial rotation of each ball will be c equals one half m two pi r n squared r one being the radius of gyration about the axis and equal to 0.6325 r. We can use as large balls as we like, and so make c a considerable percentage of e, and yet it is positively established by experiment that each of the rotating balls contain only the energy e, no power whatever being consumed in the supposed axial rotation, which is consequently wholly illusionary. Something even more interesting may, however, be stated. As I have shown before, a ball flying off will rotate at the rate of the wheel and in the same direction. But this whirling motion, unlike that of a projectile, neither adds to nor detracts from the energy of the translatory movement, which is exactly equal to the work consumed in giving to the mass the observed velocity. From the foregoing, it will be seen that in order to make one physical revolution on its axis, the moon should have twice its presence angular velocity, and then it would contain a quantity of stored energy as given in my above letter to the New York Tribune, on the assumption that the radius of gyration is two-fifths that of figure. This, of course, is uncertain, as the distribution of density in the interior is unknown but from the character of motion of the satellite it may be concluded with certitude that it is devoid of momentum about its axis if it be bisected by a plane tangential to the orbit the masses of the two halves are inversely as the distances of their centers of gravity from the earth's center and therefore if the latter were to disappear suddenly no axial rotation 
as in the case of a weight thrown off, would ensue. End of section 12. Read by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. The Moon's Rotation, Part 2, by Nikola Tesla. This article was published in Electrical Experimenter, June 1919. In revising my article on the moon's rotation, which appeared in the April issue of the Electrical Experimenter, I appended a few remarks to the original text in further support and elucidation of the theory advanced. Due to the printer's error, these were lost, and in consequence, I found it necessary to forward another communication, which unfortunately was received too late for embodiment in the May number. Meanwhile, many letters have reached me in which certain phenomena represented by rotating bodies as the moon's librations of longitude are cited as evidences of energy due to spinning motion. In revising my article on the moon's rotation, which appeared in the April issue of the Electrical Experimenter, I appended a few remarks to the original text in further support and elucidation of the theory advanced. Due to the printer's error, these were lost, and in consequence, I found it necessary to forward another communication, which unfortunately was received too late for embodiment in the May number. Meanwhile, many letters have reached me in which certain phenomena presented by rotating bodies, as the moon's librations of longitude, are cited as evidences of energy due to spinning motion i.e. proofs of axial rotation of the satellite in the true physical sense. I trust that the following amplified statement will meet all of the objections raised and convert to my views those who are still unconvinced. The kinetic energy of a rotating mass can be determined in four ways, which are illustrated in diagrams figures 1, 2, 3, and 4, and may be found more or less suitable. Referring to figure 1, the method consists in selecting judiciously a number of points as O1, O2, O3, etc., within the straight rod or mass M, respectively at distances R1, R2, R3, etc., from the axis of rotation 0, and calculating the square root of the mean square of these distances, its value being Rg, denoted radius of gyration, the effective velocity of the mass at n revolutions per second will be v e equals 2 pi r g n, and its kinetic energy e equals half m times v e squared equals half m times 2 pi r g n squared. In figure 2, the mass m, rotating n times per second, about an axis zero at right angles to the plane of the paper. In figure two, the mass m rotating n times per second, about an axis zero at right angles to the plane of the paper, is divided into numerous elements or small parts, most conveniently very thin concentric laminae, as one, 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 two, one, three, etc., at distances r1, r2, r3, etc., from zero. Since the kinetic energy of each part is equal to half the product of its mass and the square of the velocity, the sum of all these elemental energies, E equals half mv2 equals half m1, v12 plus one half m2, v2 squared plus one half ma v squared three plus equals half m1 times 2 pi r 1 n squared, plus half m2 times 2 pi r squared n squared, plus 1 half ms, 2 pi r 3 n squared. A different form of expression for the energy of a rotating body may be obtained by determining its moment of inertia. For this purpose, the mass m in figure 3 rotating n times per second about an axis O, is separated into minute parts as m1, m2, m3, etc., respectively at distances r1, r2, r3, etc., from the same. 
the sum of the products of all these small masses and the squares of their distances is the moment of inertia i and then e equals one half i w two w equals two pi n being the angular velocity it is obvious that in all these instances many points or elements will be required for great accuracy but as a rule very few are sufficient in practice still another way to compute the kinetic energy is illustrated in figure four in which case quantity i is given in terms of the moment of inertia ic about another axis parallel to zero and passing through the center of gravity c of mass m in conformity with this the energy of motion e equals half m v squared plus half i e w squared in which equation v is the velocity of the center of gravity the proceeding is deemed indispensable as i note that the correspondents even those who seem thoroughly familiar with mechanical principles fail to make a distinction between theoretical and physical truths which is essential to my argument in estimating the kinetic energy of a rotating mass in any of the ways indicated we arrive through suitable conceptions and methods of approximation at expressions which may be made quantitatively precise to any desired degree but do not truly define the actual condition of the body to illustrate when proceeding according to the plan of figure one we find a certain hypothetical velocity with which the entire mass should move in order to contain the same energy a state wholly imaginary and irreconcilable with the actual only when all particles of the body have the same velocity does the product one half m v squared specify a physical fact and is numerically and descriptively accurate still more remote from palpable truth is the equation of motion obtained in the manner indicated in figure four in which the first term represents the kinetic energy of translation of the body as a whole and the second that of its axial rotation the former would demand a movement of the mass in a definite path and direction all particles having the same velocity the latter its simultaneous motion in another path and direction the particles having different velocities this abstract idea of angular motion is chiefly responsible for the illusion of the moon's axial rotation which i shall endeavor to dispel by additional evidences with this object attention is called to figure five showing a system composed of eight balls m which are carried on spokes s radiating from a hub h rotatable around a central axis zero in bearings supposed to be frictionless it is an arrangement similar to that before illustrated with the exception that the balls instead of forming parts of the spokes are supported in screw pivots which are normally loose but can be tightened so as to permit both free turning and rigid fixing as may be desired to facilitate observation the spokes are provided with radial marks and the lower sides of the balls are shaded assume first that the drawing depicts the state of the rest the balls being rotatable without friction and let an angular velocity w equals two pi n be imparted to the system in the clockwise direction as indicated by the long solid arrow viewing a ball as m its successive positions one two three to eight in space and also relatively to the spoke will be just as drawn and it is evident from an inspection of the diagram that while moving with the angular velocity w about zero in the clockwise direction the ball turns with respect to its axis at the same angular velocity but in the opposite direction that of the dotted arrow the combined result of these two motions is a translatory movement of the ball such that all particles are animated with the same velocity v which is that of its center of gravity in this case granted that there is absolutely no friction the kinetic energy of each ball will be given by the product of one half m times v squared 
not approximately but with mathematical rigor if now the pivots are screwed tight and the balls fixed rigidly to the spokes this angular motion relatively to their axis becomes physically impossible and then it is found that the kinetic energy of each ball is increased the increment being exactly the energy of rotation of the ball on its axis this fact which is borne out both by theory and experiment is the foundation of the general notion that a gyrating body in this instance ball m presenting always the same face towards the center of motion actually rotates upon its axis in the same sense as indicated by the short full arrow but it does not though to the eye it seems so the fallacy will become manifest on further inquiry to begin with observe that when a mass say the armature of an electric motor rotating with the angular velocity w is reversed its speed is minus w and the difference w minus times minus w equals two times w now in fixing the ball to the spoke the change of angular velocity is only w therefore an additional velocity w would have to be imparted to it in order to cause a clockwise rotation of the ball on its axis in the true significance of the word the kinetic energy would then be equal to the sum of the energies of the translatory and axial motions not merely in the abstract mathematical meaning but as a physical fact i am well aware that according to the prevailing opinion when the ball is free on the pivots it does not turn on its axis at all and only rotates with the angular velocity of the frame when rigidly attached to the same but the truth will appear upon a closer examination of this kind of movement let the system be rotated as first assumed and illustrated the balls being perfectly free on the pivots and imagine the latter to be gradually tightened to cause friction slowly reducing and finally preventing the slip at the outset all particles of each ball have been moving with the speed of its center of gravity but as the bearing resistance asserts itself more and more the translatory velocity of the particles nearer to the axis zero will be diminishing while that of the diametrically opposite ones will be increasing until the maxima of these changes are attained when the balls are firmly held in this operation we have thus deprived those parts of the masses which are nearer to the center of motion of some kinetic energy of translation while adding to the energy of those which are farther and obviously the gain was greater than the loss so that the effective velocity of each ball as a whole was increased only so have we augmented the kinetic energy of the system not by causing axial rotation of the balls the energy e of each of these is solely that of translatory movement with an effective velocity v e as above defined such that e equals half m v e squared the axial rotations of the ball in either direction are but apparent they have no reality whatever and call for no mechanical effort it is merely when an extraneous force acts independently to turn the whirling body on its axis that energy comes into play incidentally it should be pointed out that in true axial rotation of a rigid and homogeneous mass all symmetrically situated particles contribute equally to the momentum which is not the case here that there exists not even the slightest tendency to such motion can however be readily established for this purpose i would refer to figure six showing a ball m of radius r the center c of which is at a distance r from axis zero and which is bisected by a tangential plane p p as indicated the lower half sphere being shaded for distinction the kinetic energy of the ball when whirled n times per second about zero is according to the first form of expression e equals half m v e squared equals half m times two pi r g n squared m being the mass and r g the radius of gyration but as explained in connection with figure four 
we have also E equals one half M V squared plus one half I E W squared V equals two pi R N being the velocity of the center of gravity C and I C the moment of inertia of the ball about the parallel axis passing through C and equal to two fifths M I squared so that E equals half M times two pi R N squared plus half m r squared times 2 pi n squared neither of these two expressions for e describes the actual state of the body but the first is certainly preferable conveying as it does the idea of a single motion instead of two one of which moreover is devoid of existence i shall first undertake to demonstrate that there is no torque or rotary effort about center c and that the kinetic energy of the supposed axial rotation of the ball is mathematically equal to zero this makes it necessary to consider the two halves separated by the tangential plane p p wholly independent from one another let c one and c two be their centers of gravity then c c one equals c c two equals three eighths r in order to ascertain the kinetic energy of the hemispheres we have to find the radii of gyration which can be done by determining the moments of inertia i c one and i c two about parallel axis passing through c one and c two complex calculation will be avoided by remembering that the moment of inertia of either one of the half spheres about an axis through c is i c equals one half m r squared and since m equals 2m ic equals two fifths m r squared this can be expressed in terms of the moments ic1 and ic2 namely ic equals ic1 plus m times 3 eighths r squared equals ic2 plus m times 3 eighths r squared hence ic1 equals ic2 equals ic minus m times 3 eighths r squared equals two fifths m times r squared minus nine sixty fourths m times r squared equals eighty three three hundred and twentieths m times r squared following the same rule the moments of inertia of the half spheres about the axis passing through the center of motion zero can be found designating the moments for the upper and lower halves of the ball respectively i o one and i o two we have i o one equals m times r plus three eighths r squared plus i c one equals m times r plus three eighths r squared plus eighty three three hundred and twentieths m times r squared and i o squared equals m times r minus three eighths r squared plus i c squared equals m times r minus three eighths r squared plus eighty three three hundred and twentieths m r squared thus for the upper half sphere the radius of the gyration r g one equals i o one divided by m equals r plus three eighths r squared plus eighty three three twentieths r squared and for the lower one r g two equals i o two divided by m equals r minus three eighths r squared plus eighty three three twentieths r squared these are the distances from the center zero at which the masses of the half spheres may be concentrated and then the algebraic sum of their energies which are wholly translatory those of axial rotation being nil will be exactly equal to the total kinetic energy of the ball as a unit the significance of this will be understood by reference to figure seven in which the two masses condensed into points are represented as attached to independent weightless strings of lengths r g one and r g two which are purposely shown as displaced but should be imagined as coincident it will be readily seen that if both strings are cut in the same instant the masses will fly off in tangents to their circular orbits the angular movement becoming rectilinear without any transformation of energy occurring let us now inquire what will happen if the two masses are rigidly joined the connection being assumed imponderable here we come to the real bug in the question under discussion evidently so long as the whirling motion continues and both the masses have precisely the same angular velocity 
this connecting link will be of no effect whatever not the slightest turning effort about the common center of gravity of the masses or tendency of equalization of energy between them will exist the moment the strings are broken and they are thrown off they will begin to rotate but as pointed out before this motion neither adds to or detracts from the energy stored the rotation is however not due to an exclusive virtue of angular motion but to the fact that the tangential velocities of the masses or parts of the body thrown off are different to make this clear and to investigate the effects produced imagine two rifle barrels as shown in figure eight placed parallel to each other with their axes separated by a distance r g one minus r g two and assume that two balls of the same diameter each having mass m are discharged with muzzle velocities v one and v two respectively equal to two pi n r g one and two pi n r g two as in the case just considered if it be further supposed that at the instance of leaving the barrels the balls are joined by a rigid but weightless link they will rotate about their common center of gravity and in accordance with the statement in my previous article above mentioned the relation will exist v1 minus v2 divided by 2 equals pi n times rg1 minus rg2 n being the number of revolutions per second the equalization of the speeds and kinetic energies of the balls will be under these circumstances very rapid but in two heavenly bodies linked by gravitational attraction the process might require ages now this whirling movement is real and requires energy which obviously must be derived from that originally imparted and consequently must reduce the velocity of the balls in the direction of flight by an amount which can be easily calculated at the moment of discharge the total kinetic energy was e equals half m v one squared plus half m v two squared which is evidently equal to m v three squared v three being the effective velocity of the common center of gravity from which follows that v three equals v one squared plus v two squared divided by two the speed of revolution of the masses is of course v one minus v two divided by two and the rotational energy of both balls which must be considered as points is e equals m times v one minus v two m times v one minus v two divided by two the kinetic energy of translation in the direction of flight then is one half m v one squared plus one half m v two squared minus m times v one minus v two divided by two equals m times v one plus v two divided by two equals m v four squared v four equals v one plus v two divided by two being the speed of the common center of gravity so that v three minus v four is the loss of velocity in the direction of flight owing to the rotation of the two mass points if instead of these we would deal with the balls as they are their rotational energy e one equals e plus i w squared equals m times v one plus v two divided by two plus i times two pi n squared i being the moment of inertia of each ball about its axis as will be seen we arrive at precisely the same result whether the movement is rectilinear or in a circle in both cases the total kinetic energy can be divided into two parts respectively of the same numerical values but there is an essential difference in angular motion the axial rotation is nothing more than an abstract conception in rectilinear movement it is a positive event virtually all satellites rotate in like manner and the probability that the acceleration or retardation of their axial motions if they ever existed should come to a stop precisely at a definite angular velocity is infinitesimal while it is almost absolutely certain that all movement of this kind would ultimately cease the most plausible view is that no true moon has ever rotated on its axis for at the time of its birth there must have been some deformation and displacement of its center of gravity 
through the attractive force of the mother planet so as to make its peculiar position in space relative to the latter in which it persists irrespective of distance more or less stable in explanation of this suppose that one of the balls as m in figure five is not of homogeneous material and that it is similarly supported but on an axis passing through its center of gravity instead of form then no matter in what position the ball is fixed on the pivots its kinetic energy and centrifugal pull will be the same nevertheless a directive tendency will exist as the two centers do not coincide and there is consequently no dynamic balance when permitted to turn freely on the axis of gravity the body of whatever shape it may be will tend to place itself so that the line joining the two center points to zero and there may be two positions of stability but generally if the center of gravity is not greatly displaced the heavier side will swing outwardly such condition may obtain in the moon if it had solidified before receding from the earth to great distance when the arrangement of the masses in its interior became subject to gravitational forces of its own vastly greater than the terrestrial it has been suggested that the planet is egg-shaped or ellipsoidal but the departure from spherical form must be inconsiderable it may even be a perfect sphere with the centers of gravity and symmetry coinciding and still rotate as it does whatever be its origin and past history the fact is that at present all parts have the same angular velocity as though it were rigidly connected with the earth this state must endure forever unless forces from without the lunar terrestrial system bring about different conditions and thus the hope of the stargazers that its other side may become visible some day must be indefinitely deferred a motion of this character as i have shown precludes the possibility of axial rotation the easiest way to free ourselves of this illusion is to conceive the satellite subdivided into minute and entirely independent parts as dust particles which have different orbital but rigorously the same angular velocities one must at once recognize that the kinetic energy of such an agglomeration is solely translational there being absolutely no tendency to axial rotation this makes it also perfectly clear why the moon provided its distance does not greatly increase must always turn the same face to us even without any inherent tendency nor so much as the slightest effort from the earth referring to the librations of longitude i do not see that they have any bearing on this question in astronomical treatises the axial rotation of the moon is accepted as a material fact and it is thought that its angular velocity is constant while that of the orbital movement is not thus resulting in an apparent oscillation revealing more of its surface to our view to a degree this may be true but i hold that the mere change of orbital velocity as will be evident from what has been stated before could not produce these phenomena for no matter how fast or slow the gyration the position of the body relative to the center of attraction remains the same the real cause of these axial displacements is the changing distance of the moon from the earth owing to which the tangential components of velocity of its parts are varied in apogee when the planet recedes the radial component of velocity decreases while the tangential increases but as the decrement of the former is the same for all parts this is more pronounced in the regions facing the earth than in those turning away from it the consequence being an axial displacement exposing more of the eastern side in perigree on the contrary the radial component increases and the effect is just the opposite with the result that more of the western side is seen the moon actually swings on the axis passing through its center of gravity on which it is supported like a ball on a string the forces involved in these pendular movements are incomparably smaller than those required to effect changes in orbital velocity if we estimate the radius of gyration of the satellite at six hundred miles 
and its mean distance from the earth at 240,000 miles, then the energy necessary to rotate it once a month would be only 600 divided by 240,000 squared equals 1 divided by 160,000 of the kinetic energy of the orbital movement. End of section 13. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Electrical Oscillators by Nikola Tesla. This article was published in Electrical Experimenta, July 1919. Few fields have been opened up the exploration of which has proved as fruitful as that of high-frequency currents. The singular properties and the spectacular character of the phenomena they presented immediately commanded universal attention. Scientific men became interested in the investigation, engineers were attracted by the commercial possibilities, and physicians recognized in them a long-sought means for effective treatment of bodily ills. Since the publication of my first researches in 1891, hundreds of volumes have been written on the subject, and many invaluable results obtained through the medium of this new agency. Yet the art is only in its infancy, and the future has incomparably bigger things in store. From the very beginning I felt the necessity of producing efficient apparatus to meet a rapidly growing demand, and during the eight years succeeding my original announcement, I developed not less than fifty types of these transformers or electrical oscillators, each complete in every detail and refined to such a degree that I could not materially improve any of them today. Had I been guided by practical considerations, I might have built up an immense and profitable business, incidentally rendering important services to the world. But the force of circumstances and the ever-enlarging vista of greater achievements turned my efforts in other directions. And so it comes that instruments will shortly be placed on the market which, oddly enough, were perfected twenty years ago. These oscillators are expressly intended to operate on direct and alternating lighting circuits and to generate damped and undamped oscillations or currents of any frequency, volume and tension within the widest limits. They are compact, self-contained, require no care for long periods of time and will be found very convenient and useful for various purposes, as wireless telegraphy and telephony, conversion of electrical energy, formation of chemical compounds through fusion, and combination, synthesis of gases, manufacture of ozone, lighting, welding, municipal, hospital, and domestic sanitation and sterilization, and numerous other applications in scientific laboratories and industrial institutions. While these transformers have never been described before, the general principles underlying them were fully set forth in my published articles and patents, more particularly those of September 22, 1896, and it is thought, therefore, that the appended photographs of a few types, together with a short explanation, will convey all the information that may be desired. The essential parts of such an oscillator are a condenser, a self-induction coil for charging the same to a high potential, a circuit controller and a transformer which is energized by the oscillatory discharges of the condenser. There are at least three, but usually four, five or six circuits in tune, and the regulation is effected in several ways, most frequently merely by means of an adjusting screw. Under favorable conditions, an efficiency as high as 85% is attainable. That is to say, that percentage of the energy supplied can be recovered in the secondary of the transformer. While the chief virtue of this kind of apparatus is obviously due to the wonderful powers of the condenser, special qualities result from concatenation of circuits under observance of accurate harmonic relations and minimization of frictional and other losses which has been one of the principal objects of the design. Broadly, the instruments can be divided into two classes, 
one in which the circuit controller comprises solid contacts and the other in which the make and break is effected by mercury figures one to eight inclusive belong to the first and the remaining ones to the second class the former are capable of an appreciably higher efficiency on account of the fact that the losses involved in the make and break are reduced to the minimum and the resistance component of the damping factor is very small the latter are preferable for purposes requiring larger output and a great number of breaks per second the operation of the motor and circuit controller of course consumes a certain amount of energy which however is the less significant the larger the capacity of the machine in figure one is shown one of the earliest forms of oscillator constructed for experimental purposes the condenser is contained in a square box of morgani upon which is mounted the self-induction or charging coil wound as will be noted in two sections connected in multiple or series according to whether the tension of the supply circuit is 110 or 220 volts from the box protrude four brass columns carrying a plate with the spring contacts and adjusting screws as well as two massive terminals for the reception of the primary of the transformer two of the columns serve as condenser connections while the other pair is employed to join the binding posts of the switch in front to the self-inductance and condenser the primary coil consists of a few turns of copper ribbon to the ends of which are soldered short rods fitting into the terminals referred to the secondary is made in two parts wound in a manner to reduce as much as possible the distributed capacity and at the same time enable the coil to withstand a very high pressure between its terminals at the center which are connected to binding posts on two rubber columns projecting from the primary the circuit connections may be slightly varied but ordinarily they are as diagrammatically illustrated in the electrical experimenter for may on page eighty nine relating to my oscillation transformer photograph of which appeared on page sixteen of the same number the operation is as follows when the switch is thrown on the current from the supply circuit rushes through the self-induction coil magnetizing the iron core within and separating the contacts of the controller the high tension induced current then charges the condenser and upon closure of the contacts the accumulated energy is released through the primary giving rise to a long series of oscillation which excite the tuned secondary circuit this device is proved highly serviceable in carrying on laboratory experiments of all kinds for instance in studying phenomena of impedance the transformer was removed and a bent copper bar inserted in the terminals the latter was often replaced by a large circular loop to exhibit inductive effects at a distance or to excite resonant circuits used in various investigations and measurements a transformer suitable for any desired performance could be readily improvised and attached to the terminals and in this way much time and labor was saved contrary to what might be naturally expected little trouble was experienced with the contacts although the currents through them were heavy namely proper conditions of resonance existing the great flow occurs only when the circuit is closed and no destructive arcs can develop originally i employed platinum and iridium tips but later replaced them by some of meteorite and finally of tungsten the last have given the best satisfaction permitting working for hours and days without interruption figure two illustrates a small oscillator designed for certain specific uses the underlying idea was to attain great activities during minute intervals of time each succeeded by a comparatively long period of inaction with this object a large self-induction and a quick acting brake were employed owing to which arrangement the condenser was charged to a very high potential sudden secondary currents and sparks of great volume were thus obtained eminently suitable for welding thin wires flashing lamp filaments igniting explosive mixtures and kindred applications 
the instrument was also adapted for battery use and in this form was a very effective igniter for gas engines on which a patent bearing number 609,250 was granted to me August 16, 1898. Figure 3 represents a large oscillator of the first class intended for wireless experiments, production of Röntgen rays and scientific research in general. It comprises a box containing two condensers of the same capacity on which are supported the charging coil and transformer. The automatic circuit controller, hand switch and connecting posts are mounted on the front plate of the inductance spool, as is also one of the contact springs. The condenser box is equipped with three terminals, the two external ones serving merrily for connection, while the middle one carries a contact bar with a screw for regulating the interval during which the circuit is closed. The vibrating spring itself, the sole function of which is to cause periodic interruptions, can be adjusted in its strength as well as distance from the iron core in the center of the charging coil by four screws visible on the top plate so that any desired conditions of mechanical control might be secured. The primary coil of the transformer is of copper sheet and taps are made at suitable points for the purpose of wearing at will the number of turns. As in figure 1, the inductance coil is wound in two sections to adapt the instrument both to 110 and 220 volt circuits and several secondaries were provided to suit the various wavelengths of the primary. The output was approximately 500 watt with damped waves of about 50,000 cycles per second. For short periods of time, Undamped oscillations were produced in screwing the vibrating spring tight against the iron core and separating the contacts by the adjusting screw, which also performed the function of a key. With this oscillator I made a number of important observations and it was one of the machines exhibited at a lecture before the New York Academy of Sciences in 1897. Figure 4 is a photograph of a type of transformer in every respect similar to the one illustrated in the May 1919 issue of the Electrical Experimenter, to which reference has already been made. It contains the identical essential parts, disposed in like manner, but was specially designed for use on supply circuits of higher tension, from 220 to 500 volts or more. The usual adjustments are made in setting the contact spring and shifting the iron core within the inductance coil up and down by means of two screws. In order to prevent injury through a short circuit, fuses are inserted in the lines. The instrument was photographed in action, generating undamped oscillations from a 220 volt lighting circuit. Figure 5 shows a later form of transformer principally intended to replace Rumkov coils. In this instance, a primary is employed, having a much greater number of turns, and the secondary is closely linked with the same. The currents developed in the latter, having a tension of from 10,000 to 30,000 volts, are used to charge condensers and operate an independent high-frequency coil as customary. The controlling mechanism is of somewhat different construction, but the core and contact spring are both adjustable as before. Figure 6 is a small instrument of this type, particularly intended for ozone production or sterilization. It is remarkably efficient for its size and can be connected either to a 110 or 220 volt circuit, direct or alternating, preferably the former. In figure 7 is shown a photograph of a larger transformer of this kind. The construction and disposition of the parts is as before, but there are two condensers in the box, one of which is connected to the circuit as in the previous cases, while the other is shunned to the primary coil. In this manner, currents of great volume are produced in the latter, and the secondary effects are accordingly magnified. The introduction of an additional tuned circuit secures also other advantages, but the adjustments are rendered more difficult and for this reason it is desirable 
to use such an instrument in the production of currents of a definite and unchanging frequency. Figure 8 illustrates a transformer with rotary brake. There are two condensers of the same capacity in the box which can be connected in series or multiple. The charging inductances are in the form of two long spools upon which are supported the secondary terminals. A small direct current motor, the speed of which can be varied within wide limits, is employed to drive a specially constructed make and break. In other features, the oscillator is like the one illustrated in figure 3, and its operation will be readily understood from the foregoing. This transformer was used in my wireless experiments and frequently also for lighting the laboratory by my vacuum tubes and was likewise exhibited as my lecture before the New York Academy of Sciences above mentioned. Coming now to machines of the second class. Figure 9 shows an oscillatory transformer comprising a condenser and charging inductance enclosed in a box a transformer and a mercury circuit controller, the latter being of a construction described for the first time in my patent number 609-251 of August 16, 1898. It consists of a motor-driven hollow pulley containing a small quantity of mercury which is thrown outwardly against the walls of the vessel by centrifugal force and entrains a contact wheel which periodically closes and opens the condenser circuit. By means of adjusting screws above the pulley, the depth of immersion of the veins and consequently also the duration of each contact can be varied at desire and thus the intensity of the effects and their character controlled. This form of brake has given thorough satisfaction, working continuously with currents of from 20 to 25 ampere. The number of interruptions is usually from 500 to 1000 per second, but higher frequencies are practicable. The space occupied is about 10 inch by 8 inch by 10 inch, and the output approximately a half kilowatt. In the transformer just described, the brake is exposed to the atmosphere, and slow oxidation in the mercury takes place. This disadvantage is overcome in the instrument shown in figure 10, which consists of a perforated metal box containing the condenser and charging inductance and carrying on the top a motor driving the brake and a transformer. The mercury brake is of a kind to be described and operates on the principle of a jet which establishes intermittently contact with a rotating wheel in the interior of the pulley. The stationary parts are supported in the vessel on a bar passing through the long hollow shaft of the motor and a mercury seal is employed to effect hermetic closure of the chamber enclosing the circuit controller. The current is led into the interior of the pulley through two sliding rings on the top which are in series with the condenser and primary. The exclusion of the oxygen is a decided improvement, the deterioration of the metal and attendant trouble being eliminated and perfect working conditions continuously maintained. Figure 11 is a photograph of a similar oscillator with hermetically enclosed mercury brake. In this machine the stationary parts of the interrupter in the interior of the pulley were supported on a tube through which was led an insulated wire connecting to one terminal of the brake, while the other was in contact with the vessel. The sliding rings were, in this manner, avoided and the construction simplified. The instrument was designed for oscillations of lower tension and frequency requiring primary currents of comparatively smaller amperage and was used to excite other resonant circuits. Figure 12 shows an improved form of oscillator of the kind described in Figure 10, in which the supporting bar through the hollow motor shaft was done away with, the device pumping the mercury being kept in position by gravity, as will be more fully explained with reference to another figure. Both the capacity of the condenser and primary turns were made variable with the view of producing oscillations of several frequencies. Figure 13 is a photographic view of another form of oscillatory transformer 
with hermetically sealed mercury interrupter and figure 14 diagrams showing the circuit connections and arrangement of parts reproduced from my patent number 609 245 of august 16 1898 describing this particular device the condenser inductance transformer and circuit controller are disposed as before but the latter is of different construction which will be clear from an inspection of figure 14 the hollow pulley a is secured to a shaft c which is mounted in a vertical bearing passing for the stationary field magnet d of the motor in the interior of the vessel is supported on frictionless bearings a body h of magnetic material which is surrounded by a dome b in the center of a laminated iron ring with pole pieces oo wound with energizing coils p the ring is supported on four columns and when magnetized keeps the body edge in position while the pulley is rotated the latter is of steel but the dome is preferably made of german silver burnt black by acid or nickeled the body edge carries a short tube k bent as indicated to catch the fluid as it is whirled around and project it against the teeth of a wheel fastened to the pulley this wheel is insulated and contact from it to the external circuit is established through a mercury cup as the pulley is rapidly rotated a jet of the fluid is thrown against the wheel thus making and breaking contact about thousand times per second the instrument works silently and owing to the absence of all deteriorating agents keeps continually clean and in perfect condition the number of interruptions per second may be much greater however so as to make the current suitable for wireless telephony and like purposes a modified form of oscillator is represented in figures 15 and 16 the former being a photographic view and the latter a diagrammatic illustration showing the arrangement of the interior parts of the controller in this instance the shaft b carrying the vessel a is hollow and supports in frictionless bearings a spindle j to which is fastened a weight k insulated from the latter but mechanically fixed to it is a curved arm uppercase l upon which is supported freely rotatable a brake wheel with projections uppercase q uppercase q the wheel is in electrical connection with the external circuit through a mercury cup and an insulated plug supported from the top of the pulley owing to the inclined position of the motor the weight k keeps the brake wheel in place by the force of gravity and as the pulley is rotated the circuit including the condenser and primary coil of the transformer is rapidly made and broken Figure 17 shows a similar instrument in which, however, the make-and-break device is a jet of mercury impinging against an insulated toothed wheel carried on an insulated stud in the center of the cover of the pulley as shown. Connection to the condenser circuit is made by brushes bearing on this plug. Figure 18 is a photograph of another transformer with a mercury circuit controller of the wheel type modified in some features on which it is unnecessary to dwell these are but a few of the oscillatory transformers i have perfected and constitute only a small part of my high frequency apparatus of which i hope to give a full description when i shall have freed myself of pressing duties at some future date End of section 14. Recording by Monica M.C. End of my inventions and other works of Nikola Tesla. Electrical Experimenter, February to October 1919 by Nikola Tesla.